I want to talk today about efficient markets, which is a uh, theory that is a half truth, I, I will say. Uh, before I start, I wanted to just uh, give a few thoughts about uh, David Swenson's lecture last period. David Swen well, let me say that first of all, the efficient markets is a hy hypothesis or the efficient markets theory is a theory that markets efficiently incorporate all public information and that therefore you cannot beat the market because the market has all the information in it. You think you're smarter than the market, that you know something? No, the market knows more than you do <laughs> and you'll find out that the market wins every time. That's the efficient markets hypothesis. So, it's a very far-reaching hypothesis. Uh, it means that don't even try to beat the market. So, uh, that was a very rudimentary introduction to today's lecture. Um, but here I brought in David Swenson, who claims, uh, not who claims, who is claimed to have beaten the market consistently since 1985 and dramatically. Uh, and so, what do we make of that? that that's, uh, that's the subject of today's lecture. Uh, by the way, after class, one of you came up. Uh, thank you. It was nice. <laughs> I don't know where you are. Uh, one of you came up and thanked Swenson for his scholarship at Yale. Uh, Yale now has uh, need blind um, admissions for the world. And so people, not just from the United States, people are helped out so that people who go through, who manage to meet the high admission standards here get. Uh, make it possible to actually come here. And that's partly, that's substantially David Swenson who did that because it's not just the generosity of the university, they have to have the money to do it. Uh, and so, somehow he seems to have made it. Now, I know that there are still many cynics. The, the efficient markets hypothesis is, remains, uh, it has a lot of adherence still. Uh, and it's, as I say, it's a half-truth. Uh, so, some people will say Swenson was just lucky. And I say, well, how could he have been lucky for 25 years in a row? Well, uh, not every single year, but pretty, well, pretty much. And they'd say, well, but you know, you're looking at, you're picking the one guy out of millions, you know, who was just the luckiest. And so, those arguments are, are, are made. Um, so, uh, Anyway, I, 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 one, of, one of you asked a question which I thought was very good at the end, and that is why in all of my discussion about Swenson and in all of his talk, he never mentioned the Sharpe ratio. Uh, because as we said, the Sharpe ratio corrects for risk taking. Uh, it's easy to get, that was one of our fundamental lessons when we showed you the efficient portfolio frontier and the tangency line. You can get any expected return you want at the expense of higher uncertainty. You do a very risky portfolio and you have high expected return because of the risk, if the risk is measured right. Uh, and so, uh, but I, you know, I think that's a good, very good question because I caught myself not correcting for it. I just said Yale's portfolio had a high return and I didn't correct for. Uh, standard deviation of return. Uh, so, David Swenson in his answer, as you'll recall, essentially said he doesn't believe in sharp ratios because <coughs> we can't measure the standard deviation. So, the, the sharp ratio is the excess return of a portfolio over the market divided by the standard deviation of the return. Okay, and, and that scales it down. So, if the expected, if the excess return is very high, but it also has a very high standard deviation, that shows they were just taking risks. And so, the Sharpe ratio would, would reveal that. But Swenson said, I don't think that you can measure the standard deviation of returns. Isn't that what his answer was? Well, you were here. Uh, I may not be quoting him exactly right. So, why wouldn't you be able to measure the standard deviation of returns? Uh, and I think there's, he, he gave a reason, uh, which was that, well, when you're looking at a broad portfolio like Yale's, a lot of the things in there are private equity or that means privately held, so it's not traded on stock exchanges <coughs> or it's um, 
real estate. Real estate is only traded every 10 years or 20 years, and so who knows what it's worth? You, all you have is an appraisal, but that's just some appraiser's estimate, so it's not, the standard deviation would be artificially low. So he's right about that, but I, I think there's even more to that, more to the, I know there's more to this, because there's a literature on this. Um, and uh, the, uh, the point that I wanted to make is that you can do a, suppose you're managing money, okay, and suppose the world out there is evaluating you by your sharp ratio, okay, and suppose you have no ethics, okay, <laughs> well, you just want money. I, th this isn't so uh, obviously criminal, this is not criminal, I suppose, but, so you say, I just want to have the best sharp ratio for a number of years running. Okay, and uh, I'll get more and more people that will put money in my investment fund. And eventually, I don't care what happens, uh, I'll, I'll move to Brazil or something. <laughs> or some form, I don't mean to pick out one. I want to get out of here with the money, okay? So all I have to do is fool people into thinking I have a high sharp ratio for a while. So what do I do? Well, there's an interesting, uh, uh, there's an interesting paper on this by, uh, well, there's a lot of papers on this, but I'm going to cite one uh, by Professor Getzman uh, and co-authors here at Yale. Uh, it's, get, it's actually uh, Getzman, Ibbotson, um, Spiegel, and um, Welch. Uh, well, maybe I'll put all their names. <laughs> Roger Ibbotson is a professor here, Matt Spiegel and Evo Welch. And what they did is they calculated the optimal strategy for someone who wants to play games with the Sharpe ratio, all right? So you want you to fool investors and get a spuriously high Sharpe ratio. And they found out what the optimal strategy is, and that is to get rid of the, to sell off the tails of your distribution of returns. So if your return distribution looks like this. This is return, okay, and you have a probability distribution, say a bell-shaped curve, okay, uh, and so the mean and standard deviation of this would be the inputs to the Sharpe ratio. But if you're a cynical and you want to play tricks, what you can do is sell the upper tail, uh, so uh, which is very, th these are very unlikely good events, Sell them and get money now, uh, and then double up on the lower tail. <laughs> so you push the lower tail to something like that, and you wipe out the upper tail. So it goes like that. All right. So that means you will get money because you you sold the upper tail. You would do that by uh, selling call. We haven't talked about options yet, but you could do it by selling calls on the out of the money calls, uh, and you would do this by writing out of the money puts. Okay, but what you do is you kill the, you, you make it so that if there's really a bad year, it's going to be a doozer bad year <laughs> for, you, for your investors. And if there's ever a good year, then hey, you won't get it. All right? Well, these good or bad years occur only infrequently. So in the meantime, you're making profits from these sales and you have a high Sharpe ratio. But little do they know that nothing, you see, nothing, you've sold off the tails. And so nothing happens for many years, and you just look like the best guy there. Uh, and so that's an now it turns out that this is not just academic. Uh, there, there was a company um, called uh, Integral Investment Management uh, that did something like this strategy. It was a hedge fund, and uh, so it was. Uh, Integral uh, investment management. Uh, it uh, I'm, this is the. It did something like this by trading in options, and it got lots of investors put millions in them. Notably, the Art Institute of Chicago put forty-three million dollars into this fund and its associated funds, uh, and then in two thousand and one. When the market dropped a lot, Art Institute of Chicago was wiped out 
they lost almost all of their $43 million. And so they got really angry and they sued this company because they said, you didn't tell us. You know, what have you, what have you been doing? And then, well, the company pointed out in its defense that it actually said somewhere in the fine print that if markets go down more than 30 percent, there would be a problem. And somehow nobody at the Art Institute, nobody read that or figured it out. Uh, they thought the guy was a genius because this company had the highest sharp ratio in the industry. All right? You see what they're doing? They're, they're playing tricks. They're, they're, they're making it look like there's less risk than there really is. And there's a, there's a strategy to do that. But it, it didn't end well for integral investment management because uh, the Art Institute of Chicago managed to stick them on other things. They disclosed this. They, they told people that they were doing this strategy. Uh, it just, the, the artists didn't figure it out. Um, but there were other uh, dishonesties that they got, they nailed these guys on. So, um, so this comes, oh, uh, this comes back, let me say, what, what Getzman and his co-authors did is they showed that you can play tricks with the, you can play a lot of tricks in finance, but one of them is play a trick with the Sharpe ratio. But their trick was very explicit, it involved particular portfolio composition involving options, and any professional would immediately know that that's a trick. Um, and it didn't work for these guys. It was, they, they were too aggressive in their manipulation. But you can do subtler things uh, as a portfolio manager to get your sharp ratio up. Instead of, instead of manipulating with special derivatives for positions, you could, um, you could just buy companies that have that have large left tails. They have a, a small probability of massive losses, right? And you haven't done anything except pick a stock. And y nobody knows whether it really has a small probability of massive losses. Um, and you could systematically invest in that. And then you'd have a high sharp ratio for a while, and then you'd just blow up and lose everything eventually. Uh, I, I was thinking of an example from recent news. What about the strategy of investing in uh, Egyptian companies that are tied to Mubarak? Okay. <laughs> the, um, that it might have looked very good for a long time, right? But the companies might have been underpriced because <coughs> people sense there's some instability in Egypt. And look how fast it came on, right? I don't know what the outcome will be at this point, but it just happened bang. That's a tail event, right? You might look at Egyptian securities and think everything is stable and fine. It's been 30 years, nothing has happened. But someone knows or suspects that there's something maybe unstable, and you as an investor wouldn't know that by looking at the numbers. Uh, so, there, uh, you know, what I'm getting at is, is really what is the essence of Swenson's skill or contribution? Uh, it's not his ability to manipulate sharp ratios <laughs> or, or, or numbers like that. I, I think what it has to me in my mind is something to do with uh, character and uh, um, his, his real self and his real objectives. Uh, and this gets at what people in finance are really doing. I, th I, you know, I think that when you take a finance course in a university, you may uh, not get a proper appreciation of how one in a career in finance develops a reputation for integrity. Uh, nobody can really judge what you're doing as an investor because they can't judge it from the statistics. Even though we've developed this nice theory about sharp ratios and the like, you end up judging the person and what the person's real objectives are. Uh, so. Uh, I'll, I'll probably come back to that theme again. Let me also say this about doing the Getzman. Do you understand the strategy? It, 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 it's a matter of, of um, it's like selling, uh, uh, investing in securities with time bombs in them uh, that are going to go off eventually. You don't know exactly when. And uh, they look good for a while, but they'll blow up. What does the law say about this? Well, the law in the United States and other countries 
emphasizes that an investment manager must not fail to disclose relevant information about a security. And it has to be more than boilerplate disclosure. You could write a prospectus and you could say, for, for say, integral investment management, you could write up a prospectus and then say, but of course, past returns are not a guide to the future and something could go wrong. That's a boilerplate disclosure because people think, well, that's what everybody says. The law says that you have to actually actively disclose. If there's something that's relevant that would make your statistics misleading, you have to get their attention and explain it to them. That's the law. Uh, so I think it's laws like that and it's the development of, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not something that we specialize in academia. Well, we are. We're trying to develop character, I suppose, but it's not just sharp ratios. And I think that tendencies to rely on numbers like this has led to, um, to errors in the past. So let me go to the, uh, more directly into today's lecture. Uh, and it's about the efficient markets hypothesis, uh, which is a, uh, a fascinating, and to me, a fascinating theory, uh, which is not not completely true, which makes it all the more interesting. Um, the first uh, statement of the sh that I could find, I've been, I'm interested in the history of thought. So uh, the first statement of the efficient markets hypothesis that I could find was in a book by uh, George Gibbs. <coughs> I'm not good at chalk. <laughs> it breaks on me. I'm too aggressive <laughs> with chalk. I'll try to be more gentle. Uh, George Gibson, who uh, wrote a book in 1889 uh, called The Stock Exchanges of London, Paris, and New York. And he wrote, when sh uh, I'm quoting George Gibson, 1889, when shares become publicly known in an open market, the value which they acquire there may be regarded as the judgment of the best intelligence concerning them. He described the stock market as a kind of voting machine where people vote. If you think a sh share is worth more, you vote by buying it. If you think it's worth less than it's in the market, you sell it. And everybody in the world can do that. It's open to the public. So the smartest people get into it, and they, they, they soon make a lot of money doing it, so they have a lot of m votes. So the smarter people have more votes. And you've got everyone there. If anyone has a special clue, they go right in and they buy if it's positive or they sell if it's negative. So the, the smartest people go right in there and aggressively affect the value until it's right, and then there's no, no incentive to buy or sell. The other thing about Gibson, I, I, I should have copied the quote, but as I remember from the book, he says something in, in our modern electric age, uh, information flows with the speed of electric, speed of light. <laughs> okay. And I was thinking, what is he talking about in 1889? Well, you know what he's talking about, the telegraph. And in fact, they had, um, they had ticker machines that would, they were electronic printers that would print out stock quotes. Um, so, you know, they were really in the information age by 1889. So this is what happened. Uh, Gibson said, you can't beat the market. It's just smarter because it's like, it's like Wikipedia is smarter than any one of us, right? Because it puts together all the thinking of all the people. Well, they had Wikipedia of a sort because they had the stock market. They had the price. Uh, so that is the, uh, that is the statement that he didn't use the word efficient markets. Oh, actually, I, looked, I tried to find the origin of efficient markets. Sometimes in the 19th century, people would say efficient markets, but they didn't, it wasn't a cliche yet. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, a, a phrase that would be recognizable. It would be a chance. It, it, even in this context, they would use it, but it was not a name for a theory yet. Uh, the next, uh, the next, uh, uh, efficient markets theorist I have, and I put this on your reading list, Charles Conant, 
uh, who wrote a 1904 book called Wall Street and the Country. Wall Street and the Country. I put that on the, well, one chapter on that on the reading list because uh, it was a statement of the efficient markets hypothesis, uh, which was remarkably well written, I thought. Um, so he starts out the chapter by pointing out that a lot of people think speculation is a kind of gambling or a kind of evil. Speculating on the stock market, that sounds like some wild activity that ought to be <laughs> ruled out. But then he said, you know, how can that possibly be true? It's th the stock market is a central institution of all modern economies. To think that it's just gambling, it just defies common sense. But then he goes on and describes what it is that it does. Uh, and there's some really nice passages uh, in, in Conant's book. Oh, in one passage he says, suppose for a moment that stock markets of the world were closed, what would happen? And he said, no one would know what anything is worth. No one could make any calculated decisions. He said that, in fact, capital moves around from one industry to another in respect of the prices that are quoted in these markets. And if you didn't see the prices, you would be blind. Uh, it's often said about uh, the Soviet economy, which uh, did not have stock markets uh, or financial markets, uh, that they relied on prices in the rest of the world. <laughs> Nobody in the Soviet Union could plan very well because they didn't know what anything was worth. But they, they, at least they had the rest of the world, and they thought, well, that's an approximation to what prices ought to be in the Soviet Union. So they were really relying on, on these. Uh, so uh, then uh, I just wanted to just reiterate a little bit about the intuition of efficient markets. Uh, the idea is that in, if you trade securities, the advantage to being there a little bit ahead of anyone else is enormous, right? If you know five minutes before the other investors about some good news or bad news, either way, it doesn't matter, you know it five minutes earlier, you jump right in and trade. You trade ahead of them, and prices haven't changed yet. You make money. So that has created an industry that speeds information. The, the, uh, the first uh, such uh, industry that I would tell you about is Reuters. Uh, Mr. Reuters, I think in the 1840s, before the telegraph, created a uh, financial information service using uh, carrier pigeons. Okay, <laughs> You know these are birds? <laughs> and so when he was in London with some information, they had carrier pigeons that were brought from Paris. And as soon as new information came out, they would tie it to the foot of the little bird and they'd let it go and it would fly to Paris. They would go to its roosting place, the message would be read, and subscribers would be notified. And that was no joke. That really worked because you would have information hours or even days before everyone else in Paris, so you could make a killing. So Reuters today, it's now called Thomson Reuters, is still in that business. This was a, the, the, the carrier pigeons were a brilliant idea. But uh, they had to keep up with the times because shortly thereafter, telegraph was invented and the pigeons no longer were the leading technology. But maybe that was the beginning of the information age with pigeons. Uh, now we have beepers and we have the internet. A beeper is something you can carry in your pocket that beeps when there's financial news. So suppose a company makes an announcement that it has. Um, that it has, say, a new drug that is, that's successful in trials. Um, as soon as they make the announcement, they make a, uh, it, it then goes out electronically everywhere, and the beepers start beeping. Okay, and all the investment analysts they drop their morning coffee. They do any because they know they've got to act fast. So you, you get this new announcement. Now it's T plus 20 seconds. He's got his drug specialist on the phone. Okay, what does this mean? Quick! How much is it going to go up? And so the guy says, I don't know, first thought, maybe it's going to go up $2 a share. OK, it's only gone up $1 a share. I'll buy right now. <laughs> and now, now it's two minutes after the announcement. Um, and, uh, and then the, the analyst says, I thought about it a little bit more. No, I only think it's $1.50 a share. And uh, Anyway, this is homing in. And so the price is jiggling around rapidly as all this is happening for a few minutes. 
And then it settles down because after, I may be exaggerating, after 10 minutes, they've kind of gotten it. They've kind of figured it out and it's reached its new level, okay? Uh, it, it, they'll still be more, th they'll be thinking about, they'll be thinking about the next morning when they're taking their shower and they'll get a better and better, more refined idea of what the price is, okay? But, but here's the efficient markets. And you, the next day, read about it in the Wall Street Journal in the morning. You're now 24 hours late, okay? So you call your broker and say, maybe I should buy this stock. They've got this new breakthrough. Well, your broker might laugh at you, right? Because you're 24 hours late. And what do you know, anyway, <laughs> about, about pharmaceuticals? Um, that's where the efficient markets hypothesis is true. You can't expect to routinely profit from information that's already out there. If you're going to profit, you've got to come up with something faster, something, uh, something that uh, you can get faster. I think this is somewhat what David Swenson was referring to yesterday when he talked about different asset classes that have, he looked, remember how he talked about comparing the top quartile and bottom quartile of investment managers uh, in terms of returns or at different asset classes? Well, the managers weren't able to beat the bond market very much. And they weren't, you know, the top quartile wasn't able to beat the stock market very much. But when you get to unusual assets, uh, private equity, which is not traded on stock exchanges, or, or absolute return investments that he talks about, they're unusual, small, or rare investments that the public doesn't have a lot of information about. And these guys can get ahead on those things. So part of what makes Swenson a success is picking his game. Even so, the stock market is not completely efficient, but it's so much more efficient because it's so many of people <laughs> involved in it and watching it. So, uh, so maybe I should write here, because this is what we're talking about here, <coughs> the efficient markets hypothesis. Uh, I'll write it down. Uh, this is uh, the name for this idea that was coined, um, or sometimes people say efficient markets theory. They're referring to what Conant and Gibson and other people had been talking about for a long time. It was common knowledge, uh, but uh, the, um, the, uh, the f well, the, the first person to use this term apparently was Harry Roberts. Mm -hmm. Uh, professor at the University of Chicago, but he was made famous by Eugene Fama, who referred to it as Harry Roberts' idea. Eugene Fama is maybe the best known finance professor in, in the country, I think. He's at, also at University of Chicago, and Fama, uh, he's been talked about as a Nobel Prize candidate for a long time. He, he, should have won, probably, uh, even though his theory is not entirely right. <laughs> I think his chances of getting it have dimmed a little bit because uh, the theory is not looked upon as quite such uh, absolute truth as it used to be. Uh, I, as I said, it's a half-truth. Uh, what I said before, what Conant said, is all well taken and right, but it's not ex there's other nuances and it's not exactly uh, when you go back, when you first read Conant, you think, the guy is brilliant. That's what I thought. This is right on. Then you read it again, you think, well, you know, maybe there is a little of gambling in the financial markets. And things don't always work right. So he was maybe a little bit too positive. Um, so, uh, Fama, uh, I can give a little history of this. Um, it was in 1960. Uh, University of Chicago uh, is kind of the forerunner in this. Uh, in 1960, Ford Foundation gave a grant to the University of Chicago to assemble all stock price data back to 1926 and to get it right. Okay, and so they sent it up. They set up the Center for Research in Securities Prices at Chicago. Okay. Uh, the Center for Research in Securities Prices, or CRISP as it's called, uh, had a Ford Foundation grant to 
to go to the stock exchanges in the United States and get all the data and get it right. Remember I told you they have splits in stocks? So you'll see the price of a share and then suddenly the price will fall in half or maybe it will double because they changed the units of measurement. No one had, so if you wanted to know what is the price history of stocks over the long haul, no one had ever organized that and figured out things like that and got it right. And when were the dividends paid? When did you actually get the dividends? So uh, they said, let's get it right. Let's put it on, a, hey, this is really super modern, a Univac tape. Okay, that's a computer tape, all right? We'll put it on a tape and we'll sell it at cost to anybody in the world. That was, and so the Ford Foundation, which is a nonprofit, said, good idea, let's do it. So that crisp tape has launched a revolution in finance because Nobody had the data. They were throwing it away. It was not used. So, uh, how do you know what sharp ratios are if you don't have the data? Um, I mean, you could find it in newspapers, but it wasn't organized right. It wasn't set out right. So, uh, with the invention of the crisp tape in 1960, it really gave impetus to the efficient markets revolution. And by the end of that decade, there were thousands of articles testing market efficiency using the crisp tape. And in particular, in 1969, Eugene Fama wrote a, one of the most cited articles in the history of finance. It was called Efficient Capital Markets, a Review. So he reviews all of these studies of the crisp tape. Um, and it looked authoritative for the first time because we were using the whole universe of stocks all the way back to 1926. Uh, that sounded like a long time and a lot of data. And Fama concluded that evidence is, he said it's not uniform, there are some negative results, but the evidence is that markets are remarkably efficient. And this is a truth that we've discovered. And that, it was really a bombshell because he was discrediting, or uh, seeming to discredit, practically all the investment managers in the country. It was a huge industry. And he's claiming the successful ones must have just been lucky because the market is uh, so efficient that we can't see any way that you could make money <laughs> in the market. Uh, and so, uh, that, uh, the, the high point of the efficient markets hypothesis was probably in the 1970s. Uh, I'll call that the high point. It seemed at that time that all of the scholars were finding that there was no way to beat the market. But it started to deteriorate uh, the, the uh, support for efficient markets hypothesis. Um, and so uh, uh, I wanted to, there's been a change in thinking. Efficient markets is still regarded with respect, but not the same respect that it had in 1969 or in 1979. I have here some indication of how thinking has changed about efficient markets. Uh, I had a, the textbook that I used to use for this course. I've been teaching this course for 25 years. <laughs> Fabozzi et al. wasn't even written when I started. So I was using a textbook called Brealey and Myers uh, uh, that uh, Principles of Corporate Finance. Uh, and I still have all these old editions. It's, kept, it's a very successful textbook. Uh, but uh, I, 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 since I was teaching out of it over all those years, I, I went back and looked. I don't have the first edition of that, but I have the second edition, 1984. And I was <laughs> teaching out of it in the same class in 1984. Um, at the end of that book, there's a chapter on uh, the, s the seven most important ideas in finance. And one of the ideas is efficient markets. And quoting the textbook, Brealey and Myers say, Security prices accurately reflect available information and respond rapidly to new information as soon as it becomes available. Okay. They, they do qualify it in 1984. Don't misunderstand the efficient market idea. It doesn't say there are no taxes or costs. It doesn't say there aren't some clever people and some stupid ones. It merely implies that competition in actual capital markets is very tough. There are no money machines, and security prices reflect the true underlying value of assets. 
Okay, let me repeat that. Security prices reflect the true underlying value of assets. Okay, uh, that's almost uh, that's a pretty strong statement, right? That, uh, but that's that's efficient market. They just said it in their second edition of the book. Uh, I, I, not many people would say that, right? Trust the stock market. Don't trust the people you know and love and trust. Trust the stock market. Well, they deleted that from later editions of their book. And I think that's a sign of um, a sign of changes. So uh, I, I was looking at the 2008 edition. They've now taken on a third author. They're getting tired of coming out with more and more editions of their book. So they've taken on Franklin Allen from the Wharton School. Um, They've deleted what I just read. And now it says, I'm quoting from them, much more research is needed before we have a full understanding of why asset prices sometimes get so out of line with what appears to be their discounted future payoffs. All right, that's a complete turnaround in the textbook. So this is one of the most popular textbooks, uh, and they've changed completely. So it, I think we have an idea that started in 19, around the 1960s. It was somehow associated with computers and electronic databases and modern thinking and mathematical finance. And they kind of went too far with it. And they, they concluded that you just can't beat the market. Um, another thing I put on the reading list is a reading from the New Yorker magazine. It just came out in uh, December. Uh, I thought it was relevant. It's by Jonah Lehrer, and the title of the article is The Truth Wears Off. Subtitle, Is There Something Wrong with the Scientific Method? Uh, well, I don't know if there's anything wrong with the scientific method, but I, I was interested in this article because what the New Yorker article points out is that a lot of scientists, and this is outside of finance, I, I, I'm making a parallel here, a lot of scientists who follow careful scientific procedures seem to generate results that are later discredited. Um, and, and nobody can figure out why. It's like the, the universe is changing. Uh, he gives an example in the New Yorker article. There's a, uh, and this is from drugs. There's a drug, which are a class of drugs called second generation antipsychotics. These are used for uh, people who are either uh, schizophrenic or I guess it can be used more generally than that, but some of the drugs are called Ablafi, Seroquel, Zyprexa. When these drugs were first introduced, careful uh, studies that passed muster in the best medical journals found that they were highly effective and they were written up as a godsend, you know, a, a way of dealing with problems that used to weigh on people and wonderful, okay? Um, the, the medical procedures involved careful controls on studies, including a double-blind procedure. It was a double-blind procedure. When you want to test a drug on human subjects, you have to have both the, both the subject doesn't know whether he or she is getting the drug, and the experimenter who runs the experiment doesn't know which one is the drug, right? So you give bottle A and bottle B to the experimenter, and the experimenter is never told which one is Zyprexa and which one is a placebo. And then the experimenter has to write up a whole report on drug A and drug B, not even knowing, okay? This is to eliminate any possible bias. So these drugs passed that. You see what I'm saying? Every, the controls were right. Everything was good. And the, but then, as years go by, the tests start coming out, the new attempts to back up or re replicate those start coming out more negative. They didn't dis they didn't disprove the drugs, they just weren't such wonder drugs as they thought. So how can that be? And what the article says, well, it must be that somehow scientific bias, when there's an enthusiasm for some new theory, it creeps in even if you try to make the strongest controls. And you say, how could that happen with a double-blind procedure? Well, maybe they broke the double-blind somehow. They, they, they tried, but the guy, experimenter, figured out and then he started, not, you know, not deliberately fabricating results, but it's the kind of thing where one subject says, I didn't take my ablafy regularly. Uh, I took two tablets last week. I have to decide whether to throw this person out of the sample. And then I, I kind of remember that it wasn't, the drug wasn't working for this person, and it colors my judgment, so I throw them out. Um, 
And, and another thing that happens is that the studies that didn't find it might have been suppressed, right? Someone might have done an ablafy test and gotten bad results and then showed it to their superior and say, should I publish this? And the superior said, wait a minute, there must be something wrong here. Ablafy is wonderful. So, let's look. And then they find something that might be wrong. And he said, you shouldn't publish this because you, 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 you know, they find something. So, there's the publication process is biased for a while, but eventually it catches up. So, I think the same thing happened with the efficient markets hypothesis. In the initial enthusiasm, anybody who found that the efficient markets hypothesis wasn't supported by the evidence, that person would be told, look again, maybe you've done something wrong. And so, uh, so that's uh, what happened. Now, I, wanna, uh, I wanted to, uh, to do a little bit more history and describe the concept of uh, random walk, which is central to the efficient markets hypothesis. Uh, and uh, let me start, though, with a, a little bit more history, technical analysis. This term goes back, must be over a hundred years. Technical analysis is the analysis of stock prices, or maybe other speculative asset prices, by looking at charts of the prices and looking for patterns that uh, suggest movements in prices. Uh, the, the classic text of uh, a technical analysis is Edwards and McGee. Um, McGee has there's a famous story about he was a, he was not a professor he was a Wall Street uh, uh, analyst, and uh, the story about him is that he believed that you look at the prices and you can predict prices, and in fact he said I don't want to look at anything else. I just want to see prices. I'll do plots, and I can, I can, using my judgment, I can find, I can figure out what it's going to do. And so the story about McGee is everyone on Wall Street wants the corner office overlooking the, the World Trade Center or whatever. Uh, he said, I want an interior office with no windows. I don't want any distractions. I don't want the real world impinging on my judgment. Uh, so that's McGee. Um, but he said that there are certain things that you see obviously. For example, resistance level. Uh, uh, when the Dow Jones Industrial Average approached 1,000, I think it was in the 60s, 1960s. Right, um, it's way above that now, as you know. But when it first approached 1,000, technical analysts said, you know, maybe it's going to have trouble crossing 1,000. Because that's a psychological barrier. That sounds magical. How can the Dow be worth over a thousand? Wow, I'm going to sell. And so the idea was that people would sell when it approached a thousand. And it seemed the technical analysts seemed to be right because the Dow bounced around just below a thousand for a long time. I guess it was months or a year. Like it couldn't cross the resistance level. So that's uh, uh, that's one example. I have another example which is from Edwards and McGee's book. McGee's book. Uh, how do I get this? Uh, it's not coming up. Oh, that's because my thing went into hibernate. <laughs> I have to do my password. <laughs> there we are. That's Edwards and McGee. This is one of the patterns. Uh, McGee was a, actually a student of psychology, uh, and he thought certain kinds of patterns seem to have really spooked people. Uh, and this is one pattern which he called head and shoulders. Okay, that's the head, that's one shoulder, <laughs> that's the other shoulder. And he said, when you see this pattern, watch out. It's going to actually totally collapse, as it is shown doing. And so he had you plotting. These are stock prices plotted against time. This is, I don't know what the, these are days. Each of these points is a day. Uh, and this is from their book, so it's a hypothetical. Uh, you, you hardly ever see such perfect head and shoulders patterns. Uh, 
And so that's, uh, uh, that's one of the, pack, that, maybe that's his most famous, Edwards and McGee, most head and shoulders. So the question is, does it work? Does it really work? Uh, well, if, uh, in, in the early 1970s, when the efficient markets hypothesis was really strong, uh, Burton Malkiel, who was a, a professor at Princeton, and then later he was the dean of the Yale School of Management, wrote a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which claimed that technical analysis was bunk. And he said, many studies have shown that it doesn't work. This head and shoulders doesn't work. None of McGee's, Edwards and McGee's stuff worked. Uh, well, there's, there were lots of studies, but I, I actually met him at a cocktail party after his book came out, and I said, you didn't footnote all those studies about technical analysis. Uh, and where are they? I can't find them. I did a search. Not on the internet. I did it on something else, but I was able to search. Uh, and I couldn't find them. Where are they? And I, I found that he, he didn't have an immediate answer. I suspected he was extrapolating. That th there was a literature on testing market efficiency. They looked for things like momentum, whether that continued. But the, there was something r a little bit wrong with the literature. It wasn't, and it, nobody, not many people really confronted technical analysis. Later, there were people who did look at some of Edwards and McGee's uh, points, and they found some element of truth to them. So I think the answer is McGee wasn't a total idiot, <laughs> as, as you might infer from the uh, efficient markets theory, but uh, it's not going to make you rich either. You know, it's, it, if anything, uh, technical analysis is a subtle art that can augment trading strategies. I bet David Swenson doesn't do it at all. He could have asked. I, I don't know for sure. But let me talk about random walk, which is a central idea uh, in finance. And the idea is that if stock prices are, uh, if, if stock prices are really efficient, then any change from day to day has to be due only to news, okay? And news is essentially unforecastable. Therefore, stock prices have to do a random walk through time. Uh, now, the term, okay, right, that means that any future movement in them is always unpredictable. So it, it's like a, it's, it's totally, the, the changes are totally random. Okay, so the term random walk is an important term. Uh, it was coined not by a finance theorist, but by a statistician. Carl Pearson, uh, writing in the scientific journal Nature in 1905. Now, he didn't link it to finance, but what he said is the movements in some, well, th he was thinking theoretically. Actually, he, I believe he used the example of a drunk, okay? So let's take someone who is so drunk that uh, each step is random. <laughs> This person has no direction at all. It's staggering randomly. Okay. So he starts out at a lamp pole. And uh, what would you predict? This is what Pearson asked. What, what would you predict is his position in 10 minutes? Okay. He happens to be at a lamp, lamp, <coughs> lamp pole right now. <coughs> uh, and what Pearson said is, well, your best forecast is that he's right where he is now. Because you have no bias. He could go in any direction equally likely. So what's most likely? It's that he stays right where he is. And what is the probability distribution? Well, it turns out that the standard deviation around that point goes up with the square root of n steps. Okay, because each step is independent of the other, so the square root rule applies. So if you're asked to forecast his position after an hour, you would, that's a lot of steps, you would say, well, I predict he's right where he is now, but I now have a big standard deviation around it. Uh, Pearson's article had a lot of, it's a very simple idea. Uh, among the readers, apparently, was Albert Einstein, who, uh, and then Norbert Wiener, the mathematician who had invent, invented a continuous version of the random law called the Wiener process. 
But it got into finance later. Uh, and uh, in the efficient markets revolution, they started to realize that stock prices look more like uh, more like a, uh, uh, a, a random walk than a head and shoulders. Uh, you look at these head and shoulders patterns, you look for them, and they're hard to find. Uh, so, uh, so, what is a random walk? Uh, let me just define it. A random walk is a, where you have a series x sub t equals x sub t minus 1 plus epsilon sub t, where epsilon t is noise, just unforecastable noise, mean zero and some standard deviation. Okay. Ideally, it would be normally distributed, <laughs> so it would have a bell-shaped curve, and then the math would be very easy and very simple. Uh, so I want to contrast that with an alternative, uh, which is called a <coughs> A first order autoregressive. Let me get my notation here. Uh, let, let's take a process that starts at 100. That's like the lamppost. And we'll say x sub t equals, how am I putting this? Um, 100 plus some number rho, that's a rho, reek, times x sub t minus 1 minus 100 plus epsilon sub t. Okay, so this is an AR1. That's first order autoregressive. It, it's, like you, you, it's like a regression model where 100 is the constant term. Well, 100 minus times 1 minus rho is the constant term. And the coefficient of the lagged x is rho. Okay, and we usually require that uh, rho is between 0 and 1, between minus 1 and 1. Normally, rho is positive. So that means that, uh, that, means that uh, it's mean reverting, but slowly. You see what, what, what this is saying? Uh, first of all, in the special case where rho equals 1, well, that would be, I, I wouldn't call it a AR1 anymore because it reduces to a random walk, right? If you, if you make rho 1, then the constant term drops out. I've got 100 minus 100, so there's no constant term. And then I've got x sub t equals x sub t minus 1 plus epsilon t. That's a random walk, all right? So in the extreme case where rho gets to 1, an, a first order autoregressive process uh, converges to a random walk. I wanted to show you uh, some simulations of it, if I can make my thing work. Uh, so, let me see, is it here I want to go? Okay, except that I can't see. Okay, uh, this here is a plot I had. Let's first look at the black line. Uh, the black line is the st a Standard & Poor Composite Stock Price Index uh, in real terms. I have that from 1871 until recently. Uh, okay. That's just there for comparison. That is the actual stock market. Okay. The pink line is a random walk that I generated using this formula and a random number generator uh, that, you can, uh, that generates random normal variables. Okay? I started them out at the same level, but uh, uh, don't they look kind of similar? I mean, the, the thing is, if you, look at, if you look at the stock market without comparing it with a random walk, it looks like it has patterns in it. In fact, hey, here's a head and shoulders right here. Right? Bang, bang, bang. Uh, when is that? I think this is um, 1937. Uh, this is uh, 
when is that? I'm not sure. 1930-31. And this is uh, just before the war. I'm not sure exactly when those. There's a nice head and shoulders. And hey, Edwards and McGee are sort of right, right? They dropped a lot after that. But, uh, you know, I can find head and shoulders up here too, right? <laughs> Maybe. And the pink line. The pink line, you understand it? The black line is actual U.S. history. That's the stock market. The pink line is, uh, is, a, um, uh, is, a, is a fake stock line generated with pure random noise. And the fact that it's going up is just chance. Now, I can actually use this program to generate other examples. So I'm going to, yeah, the black line, it, this should change. Let me see, <laughs> make sure it's working here. Yeah, the black line is the same. I'm not going to change the black line. The black line is history. I just did a brand new random walk calculation <laughs> using my random number generator, uh, which is there on Excel. Uh, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? I, I just did that by, I'm going to do more for you. Uh, which one is the real stock market? I find that hard to tell, right? Uh, this was an insight. What, the insight is that people get deceived when they look at stock price charts. They think they see patterns. That pink line is guaranteed to have no patterns because I generated it so that there are no patterns, unless, except random patterns. But when I look at this pink line, which just came up, look at that uptrend. Wow. That's called a bull market when it goes up. And I could make all kinds of theories about why that's happening. But you know, those would be fake theories because I know what's really happening. This is pure randomness. So I'll do it, I'll do it again. I can do this forever. That's another one. Here the trend wasn't quite so positive. Uh, oh, actually, I have to say one thing. I forgot. I did put an uptrend in the random wall. <laughs> Sorry. In this simulation, I, I did add a, uh, an constant. So that it pushed it up. Otherwise, it was a random walk. I say here, and I forgot what I did. It was a random walk with trim. But it doesn't guarantee that it will go up because it's random. I'll do another simulation. Um, I do another. See how fast I can do these? This is the wonder of modern computers. <laughs> that one doesn't look. <laughs> if this were our history, people would say, the amazing stock market of the first half. Look at that stock market of the first half of the 20th century. And we would be devising all kinds of theories to explain it. But in fact, it's just nonsense. It's just randomness. Uh, I'll, do a, I'll do a few more. Look at that. Boy, that would be an, a hump shape for the whole 20th century. <laughs> we would have historians trying to figure that one out. Oh, this one downtrend. This, this is a bad outcome. This is the, the uh, Jeremy Siegel would not be pleased with this outcome because it, uh, it has the stock market uh, gaining nothing in 100 years. Um, so these are all equally likely outcomes. Um, look at that one. If, if that were the world that we inherited, we would really think there was a linear trend to the market, right? We, people would be making models saying, it just goes up. Look at that, how straight that line is. Um, the point is that you start to see a sort of reality, which is really just randomness. Uh, that's why um, uh, Nassim Taleb, is a, a friend of mine, wrote a book called Fooled by Randomness. That was a great title for a, and a great book. That people don't understand how things are just purely random. And you, your mind tries to make sense out of them. And you start looking at patterns, and the patterns don't mean anything. So I can just keep doing this, but maybe I'll, st I'll stop. Uh, look at that one. Of course, I'm helped along by the trend that I added in. So I want to see if I can get a downtrend one. Because I put a trend in, it's hard to get a real downtrend. That's sort of a downtrend. That's where there are a lot of negative shocks. But anyway, what I want to do is, uh, so, so you see the comparison of the random walk with the actual stock market. So the actual stock market looks a lot like a random walk. You know, one thing is different, though. You don't look at this pattern here, 1929, and this is the crash after 29. You know why I'm not getting that in any of my simulations, and you know why I'm not? Because I chose a normally distributed shock, no fat tails. I didn't put fat tails into my simulation, uh, and you didn't notice that, right? But uh, in this simulation, we never see such sudden drops. Uh, so there's something that 
you might, if you spend time searching on these, you might see something not quite right. But basically, the random walk looks a lot like the actual stock market. <laughs> I'm trying to get one that really matches up, um, but I'm not quite succeeding. That's pretty good, isn't it? No, it's not, it doesn't show. See, the, in this simulation, 1929 wasn't quite as strong, and the depression wasn't as bad. <laughs> anyway, what I want to do now is compare the random walk with the AR1. Um, and so, what I want to do is go to a compare. Now, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it with <coughs> comparing. Maybe I can go to full screen, um, make it look better. Um, where am I? Full screen. Uh, now, uh, wait a minute, this is the same thing. I'm sorry, what am I? I, I was trying to get, uh, uh, maybe it's not working right. Why do I have the actual stock market? I can't quite get it. Oh, I see. I know what I did. I'm sorry. This is the pink line is now a AR1 process, okay, which is which is this process. So it's mean reverting now, I, and I left the same stuff. I'm not comparing the random walk with the AR1. I'm just doing the same thing now with an AR1. Now the, the the thing about AR1 is you realize that it wants to come back to 100. Uh, well, I put a trend in. Uh, so it's, it's, it's actually coming back to a linear uptrend in my model here. Uh, what I did is uh, I put in a time trend as well. Um, but the point is that it tends to hug the trend uh, somewhat because it, uh, what, what, what an AR1, I have it here shown not around a trend but around 100. What an AR1 does, it sip, say rho is a half. If rho is a half, then it means that it, if, if x sub t minus 1 was above 100, last period was above 100, it will be above 100 this time, but only half as much above 100. So it's going back to 100. Uh, and then the next time, it'll only be half again as much above 100 as it was the last time. So it, goes, it tends to go back to a trend. But what I've shown here is a simulation with a random number generator uh, of a uh, AR1 around a trend um, where the trend matches the actual trend in the stock market. Uh, now, in this case, there is, this is not random walk, and there is a profit opportunity. And the profit opportunity is when it's below trend, buy. When it's above trend, sell, because it will tend to come back to trend. Uh, I think it looks a little, I, I chose a row which was very small, uh, uh, something like a half, I think. So it tends to come rapidly back to trend. This does look different than the actual stock market, doesn't it? It's, you see how much it ho hugs a trend? So uh, it doesn't seem to fit as well. Uh, let me, let me, I can do simulations of this too. See, this is different. This is a different world. You can see the difference, right? This pink line doesn't look as much like the actual stock market because it really wants this trend. Right? We, we saw trendy ones occasionally by chance with a random walk, but here we're seeing it's always <laughs> on a trend. And so in this world, if the, if the stock market were an AR1, it would, there, there would be a profitable strategy. Always buy when it's below trend and sell when it's above trend. Because you know it'll come back. You can see how reliably this comes back to a trend. All right. So you can see that there's a fundamental difference. The random walk seems to fit the data better than the AR1. It, it, the random walk theory says that stock prices are not mean reverting. Where they go from today is all random. If they're above the historical trend, meaningless. The historical trend is just nonsense. It's just random. And forget trends. Forget anything. It's always the drunk at the lamppost, no matter where you are in history. 
But this one, if rho is substantially less than one, looks a lot different, doesn't it? This is, with rho equals a half, this is not the world we live in. It would be too easy to make money. All these little oscillations around the trend I could profit from. But in the real world, it's not like that. Now, but what about, uh, a what about suppose the real world is AR1 with rho equal 0.99, okay? What about that? Well, that's not much different from a random walk, is it? It's going to be hard to tell the difference. So that, uh, the, the in, in the efficient markets theory period, people were really excited about the random walk hypothesis. That's why Burton Malkiel's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which he came out with, I think it was in 1973, right after Fama, it became a huge bestseller. It sold over a million copies. Because in the, at that time, people were thinking, this is exciting new wisdom. We've learned that the stock market is a random walk. And there's all kinds of implications for that. The problem is, and I, I have to wrap up, the problem is that the random walk hypothesis wasn't exactly right. <laughs> it's, it's sort of right. You've gotten some insight. But you know, maybe the real world is AR1 with a rho close to 1. And in that world, there are profit opportunities, but they take a long time to come. So if, if the real world is AR1 with rho equal 0.99 or 0.98, that means you can go into, you can buy stocks when they're below trend, but then you have to wait 10, 20 years <laughs> for them to get back to trend. So it's, it's like the, um, the drunk on the lamp pole. The drunk is standing next to a lamp pole. It, it was a random walk, but now we put an elastic band around the drunk's ankle and tie it to the lamp pole, and it pulls him back. Now, if we have a very loose elastic, this guy can wander for a long time, but will eventually be pulled back. You don't, never know when. Uh, but if you have a tight elastic, then, then, then it would be obvious that the, the drunk is coming back. The problem is that the real world seems maybe to be more like the drunk with the loose elastic. And so it's kind of unsatisfying. You can beat the market, but you, you know, simple trading rules like Evans, Edwards and McGee are not powerful short-run profit opportunities. In that sense, the efficient market hypothesis is right. So don't forget the efficient markets hypothesis. I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. It's a half-truth. It's half-true. Remember that, but don't put too much faith in it either.